to our discussion on sea level rise. We're gonna wait just a couple of minutes. We're building a critical mass of participants who are joining uh, via Zoom. So thanks again, and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Once again, thanks everyone for joining. We are looking forward to a good discussion here on sea level rise. We're gonna give it another minute. We're building a critical mass of participants and we'll get started shortly. Well, welcome once again, we're gonna get started here. Uh, my name is Wade Crowfoot and I serve as our California Natural Resources Secretary. You are joining for another installment of what we call our Secretary Speaker Series. And that is an opportunity to have a big, broad, inclusive conversation around key challenges and opportunities facing our state. We've used this speaker series as an opportunity to really surface what are priorities of the Newsom administration and our natural resources agency and bring, it, bring in big thinkers and leaders from across the state to have a, a wide ranging discussion on, on a broad range of topics. Today, we're joined by four leaders uh, across the state to discuss sea level rise. Now, Californians understand that climate change is accelerating and that's impacting our lives in California. We think about five major climate-driven threats that we contend with in California. Wildfire, drought, flooding, extreme heat, and of course, sea level rise, the topic of the discussion here today. And over the last couple of years, of course, wildfire, drought, extreme heat have gained a lot of attention because those are challenges we face that are very, that provide clear and present dangers uh, right now. Our wildfire seasons over the last couple of seasons have been the worst in state's history. We are contending with a worsening drought just a few years after the last major drought. And of course, communities across California are experiencing record-breaking temperatures uh, that are creating dangerous situations. Flooding uh, is a little bit back of mind, obviously, because we haven't had that much uh, rain and rainfall and snow, but we're, we were reminded of the, the potential for flooding when we experienced the atmospheric river last month. Sea level rise, we know to be a, a major uh, impact in California, but it simply hasn't gotten the attention or hasn't received the attention that some of these other climate driven threats uh, have received, simply because in a lot of people's mind, uh, it's slower moving. I think today we're gonna have a discussion around, you know, what is the global phenomenon of sea level rise how does it impact California? And importantly, what should we be doing about it? Today, again, we're joined by, by four leaders. Uh, we'll first talk to Assemblywoman Kati Petrie Norris, who is a leader in our legislature on tackling climate change. We'll get her perspective as somebody who represents some of those most iconic beach communities in California. We'll then shift to Ben Hamlington, who is a research scientist from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. He specifically works with a sea level and ice group and will help us understand this physical phenomenon of sea level rise and, and what specifically it means to California. We'll then toggle to my colleague here at the agency, Jen Eckerly, who helps to lead our Ocean Protection Council, which is really the point of the spear at building our coastal resilience to sea level rise. And then lastly, we're, we're thankful to be joined by Adam Cantor, who is Natural Resources Director at the Weat Tribe, uh, the Weat tribe based in, in Humboldt Bay in far Northern California uh, has been a real leader in helping educate our state 
uh, on how to tackle sea level rise from the tribal perspective. As always in the Secretary Speaker Series, after these initial thoughts and presentations, we are going to open it up to questions and answers. Uh, and so you see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any point uh, during our discussion today, please feel free to submit a question or an observation, and then we'll weave those into an interactive discussion that we'll have in the second half of, of our conversation here today. Um, once again, thanks for joining. And I wanna uh, first turn to assembly member Petrie Norris. Um, many of you know that the assembly member was elected to our state assembly in 2018. She represents the communities of Costa Mesa, Laguna Beach, Laguna Woods, Newport Beach, and portions of Irvine and Huntington Beach. And if any of us have visited her district, we know that this includes some of the most beautiful beaches uh, along the 1100 mile California coast. Uh, and so Assembly, Assemblywoman, you are leading uh, in many ways this discussion in the legislature along with uh, Senate pro tem Tony Atkins, who leads the Senate and other coastal legislators. I wanna start off with just a big broad question to help frame your, your initial thoughts. And that is, you know, what does sea level rise mean to you and what does it mean to your communities? And, and how are you thinking about tackling a challenge as, as sort of big uh, and daunting as, as sea level rise? Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Secretary, for inviting me to be part of uh, the conversation today. Good to see you and uh, really looking forward to hearing from the other panelists as well. Um, so it's, uh, as Secretary Crippett said, I'm, my name is Kati Petrie Norris. I uh, am proud to represent California's 74th Assembly District, uh, which does include some of the most spectacularly beautiful beaches in the spectacularly beautiful state of California. And um, I'll tell you, you know, for me, when we think about the, the California coast, we know that it's, it's 1,100 miles of breathtaking beauty. It is a critical engine of California's economy, and it's home to almost 70% of Californians. And uh, when I think about sea level rise and the threat of sea level rise, it really does feel as if uh, as if my home is under threat. And I think as you, as you uh, mentioned in your introduction, sea level rise has not always gotten as many headlines or as much airtime as, uh, as some of the other climate emergencies that we're grappling with. And I think part of that is because it really is a sort of slow moving tsunami. And that can make it really hard for people to wrap their, their arms around and really hard to focus on and really hard to build the political will necessary to tackle an incredibly tough problem. But uh, from my perspective, this is an absolutely critical juncture. So right now is a critical moment for California. We know that sea levels are uh, projected to rise rapidly this century. Right here in California, in my backyard, this puts millions of people and billions of dollars at risk. Uh, here in Southern California, up to uh, two thirds of our beaches will be eroded by the year 2100. Um, we've you know, got an Amtrak line that looks like it's about to fall into the ocean. We've seen king tides causing destructive flooding and sweeping buildings into the sea. Uh, we've seen bluff top erosion so severe that in one tragic incident, a woman was actually killed walking on an Encinitas beach just, just south of where I live. And so I think that all of that for me just brings home the fact that it's a slow moving tsunami, but it's here. And the next decade, really the, the next few years represent an absolutely pivotal time for our state and for our coastal communities to prepare. And so that's why uh, protecting the California coast, confronting the threat of sea level rise has been a top priority for me since I was first elected in 2018. Uh, you mentioned Pro Tem Atkins. I was uh, really proud to co-author her SB1 this year, the Sea Level Rise Mitigation and Adaptation Act. And uh, also this year, authored legislation um, to cut green tape in order to support really critical restoration and adaptation projects that are a vital part of our strategy to combat sea level rise. And I know that uh, Secretary Crowfoot, I, I so appreciate 
that cutting green tape has been one of your priorities. And um, I actually think maybe I've heard that that phrase uh, for the first time from you. Uh, so can really look forward to continuing to work with your team and, and with you on, uh, on confronting sea level rise as well as cutting green tape as we move forward. And as I said, really looking forward to, to hearing from today's panelist and uh, to uh, the discussion ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and thank you for that bill that's really focused on helping expedite projects that we know we need along California's coast to build our coastal resilience to sea level rise. One great example, uh, as I've been educated, are restoring coastal wetlands that actually serve as a sponge to soak up those storm swells and those king tides. Um, we call it cutting the green tape because I'll be candid, environmental restoration takes too long and costs too much in California. And a lot of well-intended processes that have been put in place over several decades is slowing down the critical work that we need to restore the environment, whether it's habitat for salmon off our rivers or these uh, coastal wetland restoration. So really appreciate your bill, which is going to help expedite those nature-based solutions uh, for our coast. And I'll look forward in our discussion portion to asking you more about local government perspective on, on sea level rise planning and how we build connection between our state and our local governments. Because of course, land use planning, land use decisions are so much in California, the province of, of local government. So thanks, I think your remarks are really helpful to understand that policymakers priorities, uh, their eyes and focus are, is, is increasingly on this threat of sea level rise. We're next gonna to shift to Ben Hamlington. And as I mentioned, Ben is a research scientist from NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's one of many world-renowned scientists that are really using the best available scientific monitoring to help us understand what we're experiencing now on California's coast, but importantly, what we may or what we will experience on into the future. Some of us joining today may be real experts who spend a lot of time thinking about sea level rise while others may be new to the topic. So we've asked Ben to provide us uh, both, a, you know, both a sophisticated assessment of sea level rise and its impact on California, but also a high level accessible uh, explanation of just what we are experiencing and what we can expect uh, in California. So Ben, thank you for the work that you do and I'll turn it over to you for uh, sharing some of what you've learned over the years. Thanks a lot for, for inviting me to speak today. And, and I, I just wanna say the introductory remarks really frame what I'm gonna present really well and kind of the latest science and kind of underscores the immediacy of the problem uh, here. Um, so yeah, so uh, I, I wanna talk briefly about some recent updates to the science, just to give that high overview understanding of, of what is happening with sea level along the coast of California. And I'll talk about NASA's role specifically and trying to assess what's happening now and then how to understand what might happen in the future. So if you can go to the next slide. So I've really just tried to frame three kind of updates to the latest in sea level science. And, and I frame these um, in terms of observations. So basically what, what are we seeing? Projections, what, what does our understanding of sea level now tell us about what might happen in the future? And then it's starting to shift into, into impact. So as we start to pull those observations, projections together, what does it tell us about what's gonna happen at the coast in the future? So if we start off with uh, observations, if you click forward one. So with the satellite data that we have and these tide gauges we have along the coast, we have a pretty good coastal observing network of sea level rise off the California coast. So we have a good view of what's happening in terms of sea level change. And if we look at two specific time periods, you can kind of see what's been happening off the coast of California. And it's somewhat unique to what's been happening um, across the, the entire globe over the past three decades or so. So I'm showing two different panels there. Those are the rates of sea level rise. I'm showing them in millimeters per year. So just to give you a, some context, 10 millimeters per year is about four inches per decade. Um, so if we're looking at that top panel, that's this, the rate of sea level rise, the change in sea level that we saw from 1993 to 2007. And what pops out immediately there is that off the coast of California, sea level really was not going up very much and actually it was pretty flat over those 14 or 15 years. So that's the first half of our satellite record or satellite observations of sea level. And this is due to a combination of different factors. So the oceans are varying, the oceans don't go up and down like a bathtub. Uh, there's a lot of different signals that cause variability in these regional variations in sea level change. 
But if we shift to the most uh, more recent decade or uh, decade to 15 years, you can see a pretty dramatic shift that's occurred in that bottom panel. You see a lot of reds that are popping out there. So over the past decade or so, sea level rise off the coast of California has been up to four inches over the course of the decade. So it's been a very dramatic and abrupt shift in sea level um, over the course of, of the past three decades or so. Um, this actually hits on some of the comments that were made previously about maybe there was a little bit of a false sense of security with sea level rise off the coast of California because we really didn't see high rates of sea level rise for about 10 to 20 years. But now we're starting to come out of some of those, those phases, those natural cycles, and we're seeing this big uptick in the sea level that, uh, that we're now, now observing. And just to, to kind of put a cap on this, over the satellite record these past three decades, we're seeing rates that are approaching the global average. So what we're seeing off the coast of California is pretty consistent to what we're seeing on these global scales. All right, if you ship forward one. Okay, so when we start talking about future sea level rise, we really start to look to these large assessment reports and the projections that come as part of these. So back in August, a lot of you may have heard about the recent IPCC report that came out, the sixth assessment report. These uh, contain updated sea level projections. So the best of the sea level science is um, assessed and put into updated projections. And these projections are delivered across the globe for individual locations. Here on the right, I'm showing this, um, the, the projections from the IPCC specifically for San Francisco. And there's a lot of detail on this and I, I don't really necessarily wanna get into the specifics, but you can see a pretty wide range as you go out to 2150. So there's still this high end potential for sea level uh, change um, out to 2150. Prior to that, we actually see a little bit of a narrowing of the range. So if we look at 2050, for instance, the range in this recent report is narrower than what we've seen um, in, in past reports. So this isn't to say that the projected sea level rise is lower. It's just that we have a little more certainty in what's going to happen in the near term. Um, and again, this, uh, this projection here that we see for San Francisco is pretty consistent with what we see on, on global scales. It's not less. It's not dramatically more than what we see in these global scales. Um, it's pretty consistent tracking along with with the uh, the global what we call the global mean sea level, and you see I think one one thing that does pop out from that figure that that very high end red you see there um, that that is very heavily dependent on what happens with the ice sheets. So as if global warming continues, if we still get to some of the emission scenarios that um, some of the worst case em em emission scenarios, you can start to see some of these higher end estimates on the order of say five meters by twenty one fifty in the upper range there. You click forward one. So now shifting to impacts, um, when we start to think about what these projections mean, we really need to understand what's happening to these, um, uh, what's gonna happen at the coast. And this slide got a little bit messed up there, but uh, anyway, so this is showing the number of high tide flood days that we might have in the future and showing it specifically for, for La Jolla. Um, so these high tide flood days are kind of a low level of flooding. It's not like the hurricane or storm induced flooding that you see on the East Coast. This is kind of low level chronic flooding that occurs. And what we're seeing here is based on the sea level rise we've seen over the past century or so, in the coming decades, we're gonna see a very dramatic shift, a very dramatic increase potentially in the number of days of high tide flooding. So that um, years on the X-axis is a little difficult to see, but that dramatic uh, shift occurs during the 2030s for a lot of the California coast. So natural variability, these natural cycles in the ocean that weren't a problem in the past are going to start to become a problem just because we're shifting and increasing that foundation of, of sea level. So that long-term sea level is increasing that foundation on top of which these natural cycles vary and then cause these coastal impacts. All right, so going to the next slide, NASA is playing a very active role in trying to understand and measure the sea level that we're seeing. So here is just a, a snapshot of some of the satellites that we have. Our record of satellite measured sea level goes back to 1993. So we're approaching three decades in length. We just launched another satellite in this series, the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite last year. We have another satellite projected to be launched next year to give us even better observations near the coast. So I just wanna note here that NASA is really trying to do a lot to, to monitor and understand the changes that are happening. And related to that, if you can go to the next slide, NASA has the NASA sea level change uh, science team. So the NASA sea level change team, uh, you might have to pause the video. Yeah, there it goes. Uh, so the NASA sea level change team is a team of 70 plus sea level scientists from across the US and government agencies that come together, take our observations and try to understand what is contributing to sea level rise and what this means for the future. Um, so we're, uh, and we're very heavily involved in working with practitioners, try to communicate the latest science and understanding to assist in planning efforts. 
this is kind of a unique team, at least within the federal government, where we're bringing together multiple disciplines to really try to tackle the big sea level science problem. And we do have a web portal associated with this at sealevel.nasa.gov. Some of the information I showed in the previous two slides is available there as well. And just to wrap up, uh, this is really just, this last slide is really just an FYI um, that's, uh, it's important from a planning perspective here in, in California and also across the entire, entire US. Um, so there, is currently being a, a, an update to the NOAA 2017 technical report that provides sea level scenarios and projections for the US is being finalized. Um, I'm, I'm involved in that process. So NASA is involved for the first time. This is an update to a 2017 report. It provides updated projections that are supposed to be used for planning or at least to, to serve as the foundation for the planning and also for the national climate assessment. So this report is coming uh, in January of 2022 in the very near term here. Um, so more information will be coming here Shortly, um, the scenario, so the information, the projections will be delivered um, on sealevel.nasa.gov. Um, I, I do want to note that it is updated information. It's consistent with the IPCC report, and there will be changes for, for California relative to that 2017 report. Um, and with that, I will leave it there. And thank you. Really helpful, uh, both detailed and in high level enough to really capture, generally speaking, what we could expect. I'm, I'm just curious, how does sea level rise, rise how, you know, how does California compare to other parts of the world that will no doubt experience sea level rise? Are there certain characteristics um, of sea level rise here on the, on the you know, western edge of, of North America compared to other places? Yeah, one of the unique things about the coast of California is uh, the presence of what we call interannual to decadal variability. Those, those are kind of big words. Basically, it's their natural cycles that occur on top of that, that underlying global mean sea level that we see. So one that's very familiar is El Nino, right? So when an El Nino happens, we see big increases in sea level that occur over the course of a year. So the sea level goes up, then it'll come back down. But when you put that on top of the foundation, the foundational increase of sea level from global warming, the impacts we're gonna see are that much greater. So in El Nino that's happening now, maybe we don't have big impacts. In El Nino that's happening 10, 20 years from now, potentially huge impacts and a lot of coastal flooding and erosion associated with it. That's really helpful. And I would just point out, we've, we've used the word king tide a couple of times here. Can you explain what a king tide is? And I think your point that you're making is those type of big king tides would are you know, going to be um, more normal moving forward. Exactly right. So those, the king tides, are, there, there are variations in the tides throughout the years. So there's certain time periods where tides are higher than other time periods. Um, again, it's one of these, these issues where natural variability, these king tides that maybe were not a huge problem in the past will become a big problem in the future. I did show that one plot of La Jolla where we see that rapid increase between 2030 and 2040. That increase is actually associated with, with another variation in the tidal cycle. It's actually a 20 year variation. Um, some of you may have seen reports about the moon wobble um, back the, during the summer. So those variations in the tides can cause very rapid increases in coastal flooding, um, both year to year and also decade to decade. Thank you for that. I remember living in San Francisco for over a decade and the king tide in San Francisco actually means that the bay overtops the sidewalk on the Embarcadero. And I remember, boy, early 2000s, it was really a really novel event, sort of a once in a year event. And, and, and it topped over into the street, as I recall, and created traffic problems, but it was so rare as to be, you know, sort of a once in a year uh, uh, event. I think what you're saying is, as I read the chart, is that type of occurrence could occur several dozen times a year uh, and have obviously different impact on different communities and different infrastructure. That's exactly right. And it's, it's not a real far term thing, right? So this is the projections for those 40, 50 times a year, uh, that's 2030 to 2040. I mean, we're only a decade or two away based on the sea level rise that we're seeing. Yeah, that's, that's uh, sobering. Also sobering is a point that our colleague Juan Altamirano made who, uh, on, on the Q&A function, and he drew our attention to a report uh, in the Los Angeles Times today uh, from Rosanna Shaw, who's a great environmental reporter, focusing on the potential of flooding to impact toxic sites in uh, overburdened communities or communities uh, burdened um, by environmental injustice across the state. So when we think about sea level rise, we're obviously not only talking about coastal erosion of our beaches, our cliffs, we're talking about inundation 
uh, of infrastructure. And then obviously uh, huge negative impacts if flooding reaches um, toxic waste sites. Um, so my colleague, Mark Borges, if you can put in the chat, just a link to that LA Times article today, I think that would be informative for people uh, to, to read or at least to, to understand. So thanks so much, Ben. We'll, we'll reintegrate you into the conversation. I next wanna to turn to my colleague, Jen Eckerly, and Jen serves as deputy director of what's called the Ocean Protection Council or the OPC here in state government. Uh, and that is located at the Natural Resources Agency. And it's really the, what I call the point of the spear on building coastal resilience uh, to all manner of threats, but certainly sea level rise uh, and climate change driven threats. So Jen, your challenge or what I wanna ask you to do is characterize for us What's happening among state agencies and state government, uh, given that this threat is accelerating, given that each year we're learning more about the threat? How are we preparing, planning, acting across uh, state agencies? Well, thank you so much, Secretary Crow, for, for the invitation to be here. I'm really grateful to be a part of this esteemed group of panelists. Um, I'll just start by saying over the last five years, I've really spent a lot of time deep in the details of sea level rise science and adaptation planning. But in preparing for this discussion today, I found myself panning back to the bigger picture and three clear observations emerged. Number one, planning for sea level rise is hard. We are trying to address a slow moving threat on a backdrop of uncertainty as we just discussed. We know the sea is rising, but how much and by when is still somewhat unclear, especially as we look towards the end of the century and beyond. Number two, the state has an obligation to help communities prepare and adapt to protect habitats, public safety and access, and critical infrastructure. And we are prioritizing and accelerating action in extraordinary ways, and I will share some of the highlights in a moment. But number three, there is still so much to do to increase awareness, improve planning, and implement projects. And we need to invest in local communities, particularly those that are under-resourced and will be disproportionately affected by these impacts, including tribes and communities entitled to environmental justice. As we heard earlier, the urgency of the threat and the consequences of inaction or inadequate action demands that we all work together to build resilience. And the state is helping lead in several ways. So first, science. Best available science is underpinning all of our efforts. In 2018, we produced state guidance that included sea level rise projections and adaptation planning in the state. This guidance served as the foundation for individual agency policies and decisions and is being translated for local plans and projects. In 2023, we will revise this guidance to reflect updated scientific understanding as just described by Ben. We will also rely on updated projections to evaluate the impacts of sea level rise to beaches, wetlands, and tide pools. But best available science is, is ineffective if we're not making consistent and coordinated decisions across the state. To successfully tackle sea level rise, we need everybody pulling in the same direction. And to that end, the state established a leadership team to coordinate state efforts, made up of the California Natural Resources Agency, the California Environmental Protection Agency, and the 15 agencies shown here on this slide. Incredibly, this diverse group of state agencies co-created a set of seven principles to help align state action, centered around best available science, partnerships, communication, local support, learning from resilience projects, and equity. The leadership team is now finalizing a shared work plan that includes close to 80 actions that will operationalize and implement the principles over the next several years. The work plan reflects ongoing efforts, such as the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission's Bay Adapt Regional Planning Effort, and new initiatives like the creation of guidance by the Department of Toxic Substances Control to evaluate potential sea level rise impacts on contaminated sites. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go to share all the great work underway and yet to come. 
So I apologize to our partner agencies for not being able to highlight everyone's great leadership here today. One other note on the leadership team, uh, they will serve as the structure for the sea level rise state and regional support collaborative that was established in Senate Bill 1. While SB1 authorizes the expenditure of $100 million annually to support local and regional governments with sea level rise planning and projects, a designated funding source for this purpose has not been identified. This significant funding gap must be addressed. <clears throat> Despite this gap, there is an unprecedented amount of funding for coastal resilience included in the governor's budget this year. This includes $500 million to the State Coastal Conservancy for coastal wetland restoration and other nature-based coastal resilience projects such as dune restoration, $30 million to the Coastal Commission for sea level rise planning with local governments through their lo updated local coastal programs, and $11.5 million to state parks to begin implementing its sea level rise adaptation strategy. We intend to use the leadership team to ensure that invest investments in sea level rise adaptation are leveraged, complementary, or additive. Next slide, please. But adequate funding and coordinated action and best available science while they're key to the state's success in adapting, they are key to the state's success in adapting to rising seas. But public awareness of the threat and steps communities can take to protect the places they love is an essential piece of the equation. To address that need, the state recently launched a sea level rise awareness campaign that directs the public to a new natural resources agency website which is a repository for sea level rise information about the challenges, solutions, and resilient success stories along the California coast. And while it is true that the state has a responsibility to provide guidance and funding and to set an example in its own decision making, the impacts of sea level rise and the solutions on how to best adapt happen at the local level. We need to make sure that our local partners on the ground know what is at stake and have the resources and the funding to prioritize this work. We'll hear more about that from Adam. Thank you so much. Jen, thank you very much. Lot to unpack there, and we're getting great questions coming in on the Q&A button, and we're gonna be able to ask those to the group in, in just a moment, um, including funding opportunities for local communities, blueprints for large coastal cities, this connection between the state and local governments, on sea level rise planning and action. I do wanna just provide a point of color commentary, which is this leadership group across state agencies from my view is actually a pretty big deal. If you work with state government, one challenge we have is, you know, the, our agencies are so big and specialized that oftentimes we get very siloed. And as, as a result, we can have very um, uncoordinated disparate approaches to common challenges. And credit is due to actually three coastal commissioners, Donna Brownsey, Dana Bochco, and Sarah Amanzada, who really planted a seed in my mind to ensure that we're bringing all of the agencies that are making decisions impacting our coast together to utilize shared science, develop uh, aligned guidance uh, that directs or guides decision making, and builds you know, inter interagency programs. I think each of those coastal commissioners was experiencing that sea level rise was emerging as an issue in their permit by permit consideration of changes to the coast. And obviously that's, you know, that we, we need a broader, more proactive solution. And so that leadership team uh, came together and established a set of principles, which was helpful as a framework. And then Jen, as you point out, actually are de have, have developed or finalizing a work plan across agencies. Question for you, Jen, you know, when will that work plan be shareable uh, for those that may be interested? So the leadership team is actually meeting next Monday to consider finalizing the work plan. And then we intend to bring that to the Ocean Protection Council's February meeting as an informational item. Great. That's really helpful because I think that work plan is going to help us uh, be held accountable in, in state government for what we're doing, but also for the policymakers like assembly member uh, Petrie Norris, for local leaders, for non-governmental organizations to understand what the state's doing will allow you to one, make recommendations about what else we should be doing, but then two, hopefully 
draft off some of the work that the state's doing uh, in your own jurisdiction or with your you know, own perspective. So thanks so much, Jen. Uh, we'll be you. coming back to you with uh, a bunch of questions. Um, so next, we're gonna hear from Adam. And Adam Cantor serves as the Natural Resources Director of the Weat Tribe. And many of you know that our state is on a journey to redress what has been historical disconnect between state government and tribal governments, and frankly, a legacy of institutional racism, where rather than learn from tribal perspectives, uh, our state entities actually dismiss those tribal perspectives. So the way I talk about it is we're working to humbly listen and learn from our tribal partners around how to steward our resources in the state. Consider this, tribal communities have been stewarding what we know as California since time immemorial. And so there's so much to actually learn from our tribal communities and governments and also so many partnerships uh, to develop on these challenges that are emerging. And the WIAT have emerged in that context as an absolute leader on tackling sea level rise, particularly given what it means uh, to its ancestral territories and culture. So Adam, welcome. And I'm interested in, in your perspective uh, from the Wea tribe and of course from, um, you know, piping in here from the far northern part of the state. Welcome. A lot low greetings. Uh, thank you, Secretary Crowfoot and uh, the fellow panelists for all your uh, knowledge and, uh, and wisdom. Um, got a few slides I'm gonna go through. Um, started here um, with the Tulawat uh, site, which is the Wiat uh, Center of the Universe here on the Wiggy, or uh, what we now call Humboldt Bay. Uh, this is actually a king tide, um, and so we can see how the salt marsh has been completely inundated. Um, and uh, this was a site that the tribe um, acquired, um, and the city of Eureka returned the remaining um, acreage in 2019. Um, someone brought up the impacts that sea level rise can have on contaminated sites. And thinking about tribes as stewards, um, this was a former dry dock and had a, leg had a legacy of contamination um, from years of working on boats with lead paint and all kinds of other toxic uh, materials. There were dioxins and PCBs and all kinds of bad things in the soil here. And the WIAD actually received the EPA award for site cleanup at this site. Um, so now the whole community can, can rest more assured um, under sea level rise. And, you know, a lot of folks look to tribes and there's a, a lot of buzz about, you know, indigenous knowledge and, and, and traditional ecological knowledge as it can be applied to uh, sea level rise and climate change uh, solutions. Um, and, and one nugget of knowledge that we've gotten from the Weod elders, you know, if, if they had never been removed from their lands, uh, this was a shell mound that was added to over the millennia over generations, um, it would have been you know, much higher in elevation than it is today. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and thinking about environmental justice and indigenous peoples really you know, have the most to lose from impacts of climate change and, and sea level rise. Today that we hold less than 1% um, of their ancestral lands. And so really have limited opportunities um, that we hope are expanding. Um, and really the tribe looks to co-management and partnerships with other land managing agencies to be able to influence planning um, and decision-making. Next slide, please. Um, we talked about dune restoration um, that we are really thankful um, to have partners, they were a coastal and, and, and dunes culture and are a coast, coastal and dune culture. This is the mouth of the Batwat or Mad River. And um, we can see here there, there's um, no European beach grass that's yet to stabilize the dunes. This is from 1905. Uh, next slide, please. And this is one of my favorite uh, photos of um, we got Mad River Annie um, here at Mad River Beach um, making uh, surfish baskets and she's got a whole rack of surfish drying on the board uh, behind her and uh, um, basket materials there that you know represent just generations of knowledge and really generations of, of land management um, going into the future. Um, many we ought sites are are on the coast and are are threatened by sea level rise. 
um, with, you know, less than a foot of sea level rise, 19 cultural sites will be impacted. Um, and with a meter and a half, uh, 52 sites will be impacted. Next slide, please. And so um, talking about king tides, we have a king tide coming up this weekend, um, I think the second through the, through the fifth. And uh, we're really thankful to, to have been supported by the Ocean Protection Council uh, to start um, phase one of the tribe's climate change adaptation plan, which um, really supports funding for us to go out and document um, events like the king tides. And I wanna encourage folks, there's, um, a lot of citizen science opportunities, your local coast keeper or bay keeper, Humboldt Bay Keeper has a king tide initiative. So I encourage folks to get out. If you wanna see what sea level rise will look like, you know, by what we're saying, you know, what Ben said by 2040, 2050, um, go out and see the king tides because that, that's a great example of, of what we have to come. This is here on the Elk River, um, which is, you know, um, where the headwaters reserve um, and kind of, you know, nexus of the timber wars occurred. And there's still lots of restoration that could be done in this watershed um, that we're looking forward to. Next slide, please. And it's not just archeological, um, you know, items, cultural items, artifacts to be impacted by sea level rise. This is actually also in the Hikshari Elk River estuary. And here we're looking at um, a hazelnut hazelnut scrub that's, that's right above the slough. And so many of the, the tribe's ethnobotanical sites are also threatened by sea level rise. And as we were thinking about um, adapting to sea level rise um, and also looking at impacts of the global pandemic, seed saving and propagation and transplantation of culturally important species is definitely something that we're gonna be uh, pursuing more into the future. Next slide, please. And this is just an example of some cultural foods, um, Indian potatoes or, or geophytes, uh, edible bulbs on the left of several different species that we were gardeners uh, from a former, from a Weot village site and former Weot garden and then hazelnuts on the right. Uh, next slide. And so we have this vision of eco-cultural eco restoration, um, both restoring um, the ecosystem and also restoring cultural practices. This is at the Moel Dunes um, uh, Geophyte Garden with the Weot youth as we're working to um, tend the garden from encroaching brush. Next slide, please. And of course, you know, we're talking about sea level rise, but, um, you know, it's hard to ignore the drought this summer. Uh, this is the confluence of the, the eel, which the Weot um, is, is the traditional word for the eel river. Um, so they're the people of the eel. Um, and the confluence of Gir de Galish or the Van Dusen River that was completely disconnected here in September. And so really expanding our, our partnerships. Um, this was a, a drone training session with our fellow tribe of Blue Oak Rancheria um, from pilot Jacob Pounds. And, you know, as, as we're trying to expand our partnerships um, and documentation of changes that we're seeing with climate change and sea level rise, um, we're really gonna rely on our tribal partners as well as our state partners. Next slide. This is looking south at Table Bluff uh, uh, and uh, the South Wiggy, South Humboldt Bay, and a pretty popular blackberry, native blackberry uh, patch here um, at the Pete Muir or Mountain View site, um, an important cultural site to the tribe um, that's vulnerable to sea level rise. And you know, as we're going in and beginning our climate adaptation work um, with the help of um, Prop 64 and OPC, we're going to uh, start. Uh, collecting additional uh, ecological knowledges and defining a protocol for um, sharing knowledge with agencies and the public, and also uh, acquiring and sharing rele you know, relevant spatial data and looking you know, forward to you know, expanding um, our sea level rise vulnerability assessment work to both the Eel River and uh, the Bodwat, the Mad River watersheds as well and um, excited for the coastal storm monitoring the cosmos data to come out because as we know sea level, sea level rise compound, compounded with storm surge is a whole nother ball of wax and so i'll leave it at that thank you 
Adam, thanks so much. I know that our state parks system has uh, a bunch of state parks up in, in what we know as Humboldt Bay and that, that local government is also thinking about sea level rise. And I think you had told me that there are dozens of cultural sites of the WIAT that, that would be inundated uh, with sea level rise. I'm just interested in your candid take on the level of interaction between uh, the tribe and state parks, the tribe and local government. Is there an integrated conversation around uh, coastal resilience? How would you characterize that? I would say, you know, we're at the beginning of, of that discussion, but we, we've made, um, you know, there's big steps being made in the environmental justice arena with, um, you know, working on renaming, um, indigenizing our state parks with their indigenous place names. Uh, up in Yurok country, we just saw Patrick's Point renamed as Sumeg State Park. And right now here at Fort Humboldt State Park, um, we're currently working on the renaming of that site and also the healing of that site. It was a horrible um, uh, compound for the Wiat and other regional tribes um, that were held there and treated in horrible ways. Um, and so there's a lot of healing that still needs to happen in that state park. And, and I say we're at the beginning of that discussion. Mm, thank you for that. So let's move back to the Brady Bunch view or the Hollywood Squares view here where we could see all of our uh, participants here today and get into an interactive discussion. Again, we've got a bunch of really good questions and thoughts coming in from our participants here today. We're about 250 strong uh, as part of this conversation. So if you have questions or thoughts, please do click on that Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and I'll work to uh, integrate these into the discussion. I first wanna ask a, a step back and ask a question that Martin posed and, and we didn't even you know, address this yet, but is you know, what is causing sea level rise at the most fundamental level and what will help limit future sea level rise? So Ben, let me turn that to you. It's a good question and really fundamental to, to our understanding of future sea level rise. It's really the emissions, right? So the greater our emissions in the future, the greater the warming, and then that leads to increased ice melt, increased thermal expansion. So the ocean absorbs the heat and expands and sea level goes up. So it's really it, the emissions underpin everything. So the extent to which we can reduce the emissions, our projections of future sea level rise will be that much more optimistic. Got it. And I'll just draw the link to that big international conference of parties or what was called COP26 in Glasgow, where national governments across the world were really focused on what, what we need to do to limit uh, temperature increase to 1.5 Celsius. And that's really seen as uh, an ambitious but still achievable target. Uh, because if you get above that, uh, I think, Ben, then you're talking about accelerating sea level rise and, and then sort of all bets are off. Is that fair? That's exactly right. Yeah, I, I showed that one plot of San Francisco with the, uh, the future projections. And, and there is a wide range within that, that plot. And it's really just tied to the different emission scenarios. So if we can keep to the lower end of that with reducing emissions and keeping the warming down, then uh, it's certainly better for all of us. Yeah. And many of you may know this, but you know we're talking a lot about climate adaptation or building our resilience to climate impacts. But obviously, California policymakers, California residents are committed to showing the world that we can actually significantly reduce our greenhouse gas pollution. Our target in the Newsom administration is reaching carbon neutrality or net zero by 2045. Uh, and we're doing that through really ambitious steps like uh, prohibiting the sale of new internal combustion engines starting in 2035, decarbonizing buildings, uh, continue to uh, squeeze out carbon pollution in our energy sector. So I want to make sure that we understand as we're talking about adapting to sea level rise, we're not throwing our hands up to the need to combat climate change. Far from it. We want California to remain a leader, showing the world that as the fifth largest economy, we can continue to reduce uh, emissions or pollution and, and maintain economic prosperity while achieving more equity. Uh, Mark, um, ben, while we're on, uh, while we're talking to you, uh, Mark brought up a question about the moon wobble. Uh, and not because it's the you know, most central question here, but um, I'm intrigued about what the heck a moon wobble is. So he asks, are your high tide numbers including the moon wobble? 
They are. So, so this was a study that I was co-author on earlier this year. And uh, so this, I, I mentioned tidal variations like the king tide that happen each year. There are variations that happen, happen on longer time scales. And one of these was, it was coined the, the moon wobble. It's actually called the lunar nodal cycle. So basically it's a tilt in the moon's orbit relative to earth that happens every 18 years. And as it shifts through this, this tilt back and forth, it causes tides to increase or decrease. So we're going to come into a phase where tides are going to be higher in that kind of 2030 to 2040 time frame. And it's really the, that moon wobble that's driving that very rapid increase I showed for La Jolla. So it's, it's how those tidal variations, how those natural cycles, the moon wobble has been happening forever. So it's um, basically how those combine with underlying sea level rise. So short answer is yes, that uh, those assessments do include the moon wobble. Got it. And Ben, you know, as we're talking, if, if there's a particularly a good website at NASA JPL that provides this, this information, um, feel free to put it in the chat. I know some would be interested in that. Let's shift okay. now to this discussion around coastal communities and the relationship between state government and coastal communities. What our coastal communities need to be doing. My former colleague, Gerilyn, uh, points out that big coastal cities need blueprints too, to improve response to rising sea levels. Since these cities like Los Angeles have infrastructure that's vulnerable and can contaminate the ocean and therefore groundwaters. Margaret raises some really good questions around what resources are available to local communities and particularly have we thought about providing resources to disadvantaged communities that may not have matching funds. Um, so I want to start with uh, Assemblymember Petrie Norris and just talk about if you would, you know, how you view the responsibilities of local communities that is, you know, incorporated cities, counties, uh, and the state, and, and how you think the relationship should proceed as it relates to planning and, and adapting the sea level rise. Well, I actually want to pick up, I think, on, on something, a point that Jen made, um, which is that this is a situation where the state absolutely has an obligation to help communities prepare, because this is a situation where local governments, you know, not even large local governments, but it's certainly not small local governments. They cannot possibly have the resources or develop the expertise or have the capacity to confront something like this alone. And so this is in my mind, um, a, a foremost example of where we really do need a whole of government and integrated approach. And um, I think that the state has a huge opportunity to I develop and roll out best practices and blueprints. And um, I think that as we're doing that, um, and as I, I was listening to, to, to folks on this panel uh, talk and just reflecting on some of the conversations that I've had with my local governments, um, I think it's really, really critical that, uh, that our local communities you know, first understand what's at stake, that they have the tools, resources, and funding to actually take action on this. Um, but I think that as, as a state legislator, as state agencies, I think we need to work really, really hard to keep the solutions practical and actionable and real. Um, so rather than focusing on the you know thousand page white paper that's really hard for people to have any actual takeaways from, I think that we should be approaching this as uh, you know, that the goal of, of our state interagency bo working bodies should be to put together an incredibly simple and straightforward toolkit for coastal cities. Um, instead of standing up a bunch of overlapping grant programs that certainly disadvantaged small local communities are never going to be able to navigate or access funding from, you know, one statewide sea level rise fund program, that everybody understands what it is, what they can use it for, how to access those funding, that, that funding. So I think that there's an opportunity on so many levels for us as state officials to take something that's an incredibly hard, incredibly complicated problem and do everything that we can to uh, make it as simple as possible for local leaders and local community members to act. Um, and I know that, that's sort of broad, but that to me should be kind of our, uh, I think our North Star as we look at the, the work that needs to be done over the next couple of years to 
enable our coastal communities to be in a position to actually act to confront this. Yeah, well put, and, uh, and I agree. Jen, thoughts, and I'm interested in maybe you sharing a little more information about this $30 million to the Coastal Commission and the work that they're doing uh, with coastal communities on, lo on local coastal plans. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for those comments, Assemblywoman. Um, I, I Just to add to, to that perspective, I think that there's an opportunity here for um, the state to help provide some criteria and some standardization on what these plans at the local level should look like and the components in the plan where, where they allow for flexibility to um, reflect the priorities of local communities, but are um, precautionary enough to be um, to, to build that resilience that we need. Um, so, and, and Wade, one, uh, Secretary Krofa, one mechanism for doing that is through the Coastal Commission's local coastal programs where local communities um, who have uh, permitting jurisdiction along their shoreline have to get approved plans um, from the Coastal Commission and that $30 million is going to help local communities really integrate sea level rise planning and adaptation um, into their, their general plans and, the, and their local planning processes. Um, so it's a great opportunity. Um, the Coastal Commission um, has been implementing grant programs to do this type of work for several years. This $30 million is a, is a great infusion of investment and necessary, um, particularly given the urgency of, of the threat. Um, so a great opportunity there. And, and if I might, I, I'd love to touch a bit on the point about funding for um, disadvantaged communities and how we how we're starting to do that now. Um, the Ocean Protection Council recently um, uh, awarded eight million dollars in Prop 68 funding for coastal resilience projects. I would say I, I believe over half of that funding uh, went to provide benefits to communities entitled to environmental justice. Um, we recently did an individual call for Proposition 1 that was focused specifically on, the, on those communities. And so we're trying to do this in um, it, uh, make progress in this way. But I agree that we need a comprehensive program and really being clear about where those opportunities exist um, will be really important. That's really helpful. I want to challenge ourselves a little bit with a question I, I, uh, we received from actually a mentor of mine, David Lewis, who leads Save the Bay, uh, that is, does such good environmental work in the San Francisco Bay Area. And his contention is, you know, there's good work that's happening, but that ultimately additional regulations and statutory changes will be needed to reduce risk from sea level rise. And that to date over the last decade, the state has held off on really establishing new land, land use rules, mandates, um, to actually you know, protect communities and infrastructure. And he worries that if, uh, if adapt flood out sea level rise and flood adaptation remain only voluntary and not mandatory, um, then we will not be able to protect many of the communities, particularly those you know, without resources. So this is a tough question, but we, always, we, we, we never shy away from them in these, uh, in these discussions. Um, Assembly member Jen, I'm glad to uh, respond to how do how do we think about the, you know, the idea of state mandates on on local communities, how should we approach that. Um, and how would we respond to, you know, David's critique. And so I'm happy to to to, to start um, and Again, this is this is a situation where there are no easy answers. Um, but the bottom line is that we know the longer that we wait to act, the more expensive and the more painful that this is going to ultimately be. Uh, so delaying our preparations, continuing to uh, develop in uh, inundation zones is going to result in lost opportunities and, and ultimately higher costs. Um, so I, I think that we need a couple things. I, I think that we really do need to enlist our local communities as partners. Um, and part of that is making this threat real for community members themselves, because if, if the community is calling for solutions, local officials are motivated to act. Um, 
Number two, we absolutely need to focus on uh, creative solutions. And I know, at Secretary, you, you had asked um, you know, earlier about uh, a piece of legislation that was, was introduced by Senator Allen this year that would have created a revolving loan fund for the acquisition of properties in high risk inundation zones, enabling uh, local governments then to rent those properties out for the useful life and uh, ultimately develop a retreat plan. So, um, it, you know, the strategy is acquire, rent, and retreat. That to me is a really good example of the kind of creative and elegant solution that uh, we need to start deploying now. Um, if we make the decision today, we can do it in a way that uh, mitigates the harm. If we wait to make that decision in 20 years, we've got a lot of Californians that have uh, you know, multi-million dollar coastal properties that are suddenly worth nothing. So um, I think it's both uh, engagement of the community, engagement of our local elected officials, as well as developing and pushing creative solutions. Thank you. It's really helpful. Jen, any thoughts on this question around you know, regulation and mandates? Um, I would just say that I think we can consider, um, you know, uh, processes around new and redevelopment um, and, and development in areas that we know today and will be soon vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, and so that's a place where we can think about um, digging in a little bit more. Um, and, and that's all uh, I have at this point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would add, look, I think it's a fair question. One observation I have is that, you know, it's not a one size fits all to, you know, with solutions on sea level rise, that sea level rise is going to impact different communities in different ways. And there are different options and opportunities in each community. So one of the challenges when you think about mandates or, or, or regulations is really how do you um, how do you respect those, those local differences? I think also, you know, part of the relationship with, you know, local governments is generally speaking, the state government, you know, relies on local leadership around land use planning um, with some guidance. Uh, for example, the Coastal Commission just released guidance, pretty strong guidance on protecting critical infrastructure along the coast um, that will help to guide um, local decision-making. Um, but we're facing this on questions around, you know, drought resilience for local communities or building in the urban wildland interface. It's not easy um, to navigate sort of the state authority and local land use authorities. I think our goal, as, as Assemblymember Petrie Norris pointed out, is one, provide as much information, sci actionable science as possible to really inform decision making, and then embrace creative solutions that allow local communities to take action now. And to really get those, um, get you know, take take the action now, recognizing as Ben pointed out, the acceleration of sea level rise. Um, you know, in the into the future, it may very well be need, you know, necessary to identify you know regulatory approaches, et cetera. But I think right now we're really focused on trying to support communities. We hear a lot from coastal communities that want to do more uh, on planning and adapting and taking action, but they need support. Uh, technical support, funding, et cetera. So that's really been the, 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 the thrust to date. Um, Kadi, something that uh, Jose uh, pointed out and, and just be interested in, in your perspective, he says, you know, where does the public, where do community members fit into uh, supporting sea level rise resilience and addressing things like toxic site vulnerability? What can folks do that are not in government? Um, so as, a, as an elected official, what, what, would you, what would you suggest to residents who, who are concerned about this? I think that it is so important, you know, whether it's this issue or, or any other, it's so important that I think particularly an issue like this, where it's not front page news, it's not at the top of every local elected or you know even state elected officials list of things to, to do or to worry about. I think it is so critical that, especially at a local level, people start to hear from their community members and start to understand that this is, you know, in the same way that, you know, decades ago, there was this emerging science about climate change and the climate crisis. And it took a long time for, you know, America as a whole to recognize that that was a very inconvenient, but nonetheless, a, a, a truth. I think similarly with sea level rise, it is 
uh, something where local elected officials probably want to bury their head in the, make a bad pun, in the sand on this. And the more that they're hearing from folks like you, the more that they're hearing from community members that this is an area of concern, the more that they're going to focus on it. And so I think it's a, a place where community advocacy is incredibly, incredibly important. Well put. You know, there's a there's a thread of, of questions around what is California doing in partnership with entities outside of California on this topic? And a specific question for Margaret around whether we're working with Oregon and Washington, who we share the Pacific Coast with. And then from uh, Anissa about, given this is a global issue, how can California play internationally? And I'll share a little bit in response to those questions. One is we are working closely actually with Oregon and Washington on all manner of climate action, but specifically sea level rise, but also another phenomenon called ocean acidification, where the ocean is absorbing a lot of the car, uh, carbon from the atmosphere, and it's actually changing the chemistry of the ocean and having real impacts on ecosystems and even economies such as the shellfish industry, um, where that more acidic uh, ocean breaks down um, the, the shells that provide um, for that, that uh, economy. So we are working together. We've actually done a lot of shared science on how climate change is impacting our maritime economy, but also our ecosystems on the West Coast. We also started an international movement that's called the Ocean Acidification Alliance, which now includes uh, other states such as Hawaii uh, and Maryland, but also other countries such as Chile and the UK that are focused uh, coastal states. Uh, nations and, and, and states and provinces that are focused on actually raising up the elevating or amplifying just what climate change will do to our ocean and our coasts, and then taking action. Um, so there's a lot of sharing of best practices, both on sea level rise, but also how we slow down ocean acidification, such as reducing the amount of phosphate pollution that comes from uh, our coastal communities. So a lot of work uh, internationally. I guess lastly, I would point out the ones with the greatest moral authority in this international discussion are those island states that are, will actually potentially lose their entire land. Um, essentially, their countries will disappear underwater as a result of sea level rise. And they've been really driving uh, a, strong, a strong message. Um, I'm, I wanna get to uh, uh, something, back to Adam a little bit and just, share an observation from a colleague of mine named, called, uh, named Chuck Striplin. And Chuck serves as the tribal advisor to our California Fish and Game Commission. And, and he's suggesting that impacts on sea level rise on tribes fall into a, seven major categories. Um, existing reservations, rancherias, and infrastructure, subsistence resources, um, when, when we lose our coastal habitats like tidal marshes, cultural resources um, via erosion, um, cultural resources when we try to adapt to sea level rise, uh, coastal property values, tribal livelihoods, um, and then increased conflict on coastal resources. So Adam, just a perspective from, you know, from, from, from where you sit uh, in terms of that being the natural resources director of the WIAT, um, what, are, what is your tribe, you know, sort of in terms of elevating this, this, this risk or threat, what do you identify as the uh, most sort of existential threat given sea level rise? That's a great question. Um, and we have had the opportunity to get to talk to elders and, and tribal citizens about this. And actually the, the biggest concern is, is access to um, hunting and gathering areas, more access to habitat and um, recreational and cultural activities more so than actual inundation of cultural sites. And, you know, thinking about, um, you know, under sea level rise, um, you know, a lot of our low elevation sites are gonna be inundated, many of which are parklands. And so our, our new coastal fringe is gonna be these really expensive properties right on that upland edge um, that I think we need to prioritize for, for conservation. And with Humboldt Bay, you know, about 90% of the salt marsh was diked and converted. So there's actually going to be some ecological benefits um, from sea level rise in that respect that a lot of the bay will be reclaimed. Got it. Thank you, Adam. 
Specific question for Jen, and this is Jermaine, you know, uh, Curtis asks, accepting the reality that there's gonna be a bunch of uncertainty around how much sea level is gonna rise, what does the state currently recommend for sea level rise sort of planning guidelines um, for a target for 2050? I know we've talked a lot across agencies on that. Yeah, so the, the sea level rise principles that I mentioned in my presentation include um, the recommendation of building pathways to resilience of up to uh, a minimum of 3.5 feet of sea level rise by 2050. Now that doesn't mean we're expecting that level of sea level rise at that time, but it does mean that our plans, our resiliency plans need to have um, actions and pathways in place to accommodate that. And that, that number was um, derived from our guidance and is uh, the expected median level um, at the end of century. So what we're trying to do is make sure we're prepared now for what, for what we're expecting to happen in the future. Um, and these numbers, um, you know, they're, they're guide, that, that number is a, a target and a guidance, um, but really they're, may be um, situations where you would um, want to consider higher sea level rise scenarios, specifically in, um, to protect critical infrastructure. Um, and, and so that's where you would want to consult the guidance and maybe use a, a higher level of sea level rise in your planning. That's really helpful. And we have so many good questions and observations flooding in. We're not going to be able to get to them. I'm going to ask a final round of sort of a speed round of a question, give you a little time to think about it, uh, panelists. And that is, you know, what does success look like in your specific area of sea level rise in the next five years um, in a sentence or two? But before that, I want to just give voice to some of the comments that are coming in. Alyssa asked a question around the, the, the potential for our federal infrastructure bill to be part of our, our funding solutions to sea level rise adaption. That's something we're gonna be focused on in coming weeks. Um, Jesse, who leads uh, environmental justice organization in Wilmington, points out that there's a lot of work happening at the community level to truly protect uh, burdened communities, <clears throat> but uh, funding is needed to empower those communities uh, to really build and convey those plans. Stephen asked a question around managed retreat, which is pretty controversial in our coastal communities. Um, and, um, and, you know, asks us as policymakers to help unpack that. And then Cindy points out that um, nature-based solutions provide this sort of triple win for sea level rise adaptation, carbon sequestration, removing carbon from the atmosphere, and biodiversity. And really, how are we thinking about lifting those up? And for Cindy, I would point out this $500 million, half a billion dollars, um, to our Coastal Conservancy for the specific focus of doing some no regrets work, um, building those nature-based solutions along our coast. So as we're getting to the end here, um, Assembly Member, what does, in a, in a few sentences, what does success look like for you uh, in five years time? Uh, so success for me in five years time would mean a uh, clear, coherent, and well-understood statewide strategy uh, projects underway across all coastal communities and, and uh, ongoing investments in uh, innovation and demonstrator projects to enable us to develop the breakthroughs we need not just to confront California's uh, challenges and uh, you know, looming tragedy mm -hmm. around sea level rise, but then export that to uh, the, the rest of the nation and the world. Huge thanks for those insights and your leadership. Ben, in the scientific world, what does success look like for you in the next five years? Yeah, so certainly there's some specific scientific goals, but I think one measure of success for me would be if we could establish a defined and clear pathway for getting the sciences coming out of these assessment reports and observations into the hands of planners and practitioners to really try to define what is needed for planning and what we can do as scientists to provide that information really actually, I mean, in a target way, provide that uh, what is needed and uh, to do a little bit better on the science side and communicating our latest science. So I, I think that would be a big measure of success, um, at least in my work. Thanks so much. Adam, from your perspective, again, as Natural Resources Director of the WEA tribe, what does success look like for you in five years time? 
Well, hopefully we'll have, we will have completed the first iteration of our climate change adaptation and resilience plan. And, and hopefully we'll have more uh, culturally significant habitats and, and properties uh, protected or in, in tribal ownership or in, with more opportunities for the tribe to co-manage and steward their resources for, for the benefit of the whole communities, for our whole community. Thank you. And thanks for all your work and leadership on this. Jen, final, final question to you. What does success look like with, from within our agency in five years time? Uh, I think it really looks like uh, coordinated action and planning on, on the, um, by all of our state agency partners and then a, a strengthening of our um, partnership with our uh, external communities and, and on the ground work. And I really um, wanna look back and, and see the incredible investments that we made in habitat restoration, you know, that provides those multi-benefits for protection from flooding and climate change and biodiversity, um, and to then look forward to um, a more coordinated and adaptive approach um, in the next five years. Thanks so much. And, and for me, it means real action being taken to, to the Assemblywoman's point, a, a coherent plan, but with action being taken, strong partnerships between local and state government and tribal governments, recognizing just the accelerating impacts that Ben shared with us. So a lot to get done. Um, huge thanks for joining us. We have almost all of the uh, participants, 250 strong here still at the end. Um, as we conclude, I wanna share with you two events that are actually coming up that <clears throat> emphasize the, the importance of this issue. Um, the first is a entity, a, a convening from the California Coastal Commission, which is the California King Tides Project, um, which is identifying or showing in real time uh, the King Tides happening here uh, in less than a week. And likewise, California State Parks through its online education portal called Ports um, is providing a Facebook live stream event to actually look at the real-time impacts of King Tides uh, here this Friday. Uh, so again, uh, this is really two entities within state government's effort to continue to build awareness and urgency uh, on this topic. Many thanks to the panelists that joined. Uh, huge thanks to, for joining us at the Secretary Speaker Series. If you have suggestions on other topics that we should be tackling, uh, in this speaker series, please let us know and contact us at the email you see on the screen. Uh, have a safe and productive week, and we hope to see you at our next speaker series event. Until then, take care.